And on video, I take you to see the monster guns that fired on US troops as they landed on Omaha Beach, as well as firing on the Allied fleet, forcing some of the vessels to withdraw. This is Long Sumer. Okay, so when you think about uh, the D-Day invasion, you might be thinking about things like German pillboxes on the beaches or perhaps even the bigger bunkers that you would have seen from Saving Private Ryan. But the weapon system that actually caused most of the damage on D-Day were artillery pieces just like this. And the defensive crust on the Normandy beaches was actually quite thin. There wasn't really defence in depth, but what they did have are batteries just like this behind me at Long Sumer, which were spaced evenly throughout the landing beaches. And this one at Long Sumer was the only gun battery that fired on Gold Beach, but also on Omaha Beach. Long Sumer is a cliff-top fortress position protecting four reinforced casemates that house massive 150mm guns. These guns continued to fire for all of D-Day and were not captured until the following day. In total, it is believed they fired 115 rounds on D-Day. So let's look at the location of this battery. As a reference, you can see the medieval town of Bayer to the south. Three of the five invasion beaches are shown here. Omaha, Gold and Juno Beach. This stretch of coastline was protected by the Atlantic Wall, a series of fortified positions and strong points to deter enemy invasion. Here we can see footage of Field Marshal Erwin Rommel inspecting the fortifications and their impressive guns. Point du Hoc, the more famous gun battery, is located here. You'll remember this for the daring raid by the US Army Rangers as they scaled the cliffs to neutralize the guns that they believed to be there at the time. And here is Long Sumer, perfectly positioned on the high cliff tops between Omaha and Gold Beach. With its 20 kilometer range, it was able to fire on both the British and the US troops. So now, let's walk the ground. The first thing that strikes you is the elevation of the cliff-top fortress position, with these fantastic views out to sea, but also along the coast. These guns were sighted perfectly to engage any Allied fleet that came into view. So let's look at the purpose of the battery, housing these guns. Right, so this battery consisted of 450 millimeter guns. They're Czech guns and they were originally naval guns. So these actually used to be on warships uh, and they were obviously repurposed to be batteries on the land to fire both on the beaches, but also to fire at the fleets uh, at sea if there was to be an Allied invasion. Now, interesting fact, if you own a Skoda car, you own a car from the same company that built these guns. So on the top of these bunkers, you can see the, they look like shell marks. They look like the bunker's been attacked, but actually it's not. It's uh, to aid in camouflage. Lots of people think it's from shell marks or they think it's from the naval um, craft that were attacking it, naval gunfire, but it's not. It's purely to aid the uh, camouflage of the gun. If I go close enough now, you can see the rifling inside the barrel. Pretty marvellous stuff. And the rifling, of course, in parts spin and therefore stability and accuracy on the round, enabling it to achieve greater distance. These could fire about 12 miles, but also greater accuracy as well. So another interesting fact here on the gun, the reason why this welding looks so shiny and new it's not because it was done yesterday, it's because it's a nickel alloy which actually doesn't rust. So the rest of the gun and the gunmetal rust, but the nickel alloy will look exactly as it did pretty much the day that it was done. Right, so the purpose of this design is basically to stop the shrapnel from being funneled into the embrasure and attacking the crews or trying to damage the crew in any way. So actually, this jagged exterior, which you can see on the top of the bunker and also on the sides of the embrasure, is perfectly designed to stop that shrapnel from going in there. So it's a design feature for protection, not because it looks good. All 
All right, on the night before D-Day, approximately 1,500 tonnes of explosives were dropped on this location by Allied aircraft. And on the morning of D-Day, HMS Ajax fired over 100 rounds at the battery location. And within 20 minutes, the guns were silenced, or two of the guns were definitely damaged. Now, the reason the Allies had the exact coordinates for this battery and were able to strike it so accurately is because the coordinates were actually given to the Allies by the resistance. The resistance sent the location back to the Allies and they could incorporate that into their planning. We're now going to walk to casemate number three and this one is my favorite as it maintains the bearing and elevation that it had on D-Day. This gun was engaged in a gunnery duel with multiple Allied vessels, including French cruiser Georges Legueux and Montcalm, as well as the US cruiser USS Arkansas. It's believed this gun was damaged during that engagement, and it's a bit of a time machine in that sense when you see the barrel pointing out to sea, exactly as it would have been when it was silenced, almost like a gorgon turned to stone and frozen in time. There are still scars from that gunnery duel all over this gun position. On to casemate number two, and you can see the clear signs of a naval bombardment, or perhaps it was air-delivered munitions during the pre-D-Day bombing. At about 0600 hours, this battery opened fire towards Omaha Beach, towards US troops. The British battleships HMS Ajax and Argonaut returned fire, getting as close as they could to accurately strike the battery. They fired 179 rounds in total, plunging the battery into silence for a time. One of those rounds struck this position, causing extensive damage and neutralizing the detachment. And now on to casemate number one, and, well, what can I say? This has been absolutely gutted. You can see the top has lifted off from the explosion and has come back down onto the supporting wings. The gun is completely destroyed and the detachment were neutralized. It's claimed that HMS Ajax scored a direct hit into this gun, and the gun must have been loaded and made ready at the time to create this explosion. Now we know that naval gunfire is supremely powerful and it was also incredibly accurate during the invasion. Now if we look down here, you can actually see a piece of the bow sticking out of the ground. If you needed any additional indication of just how powerful this explosion was. It's probably 20 or 30 feet from the casemate and let me tell you, these are not light. So great shooting from HMS Ajax and her crew. Just a quick point on construction. It's interesting to see here a combination of block and shutter type construction at this casemate. This indicates it was either built in two phases or perhaps they ran out of wood for the shuttering and they had to revert to block construction instead. So now let's look at the rest of the battery and the fire control post. The battery was manned by 184 soldiers under the command of the Kriegsmarine, and there are a number of buildings and fortifications preserved on this site. The obvious location to go and see is this fire control post. When you look out of this observation post, you immediately realise that this battery was likely intended for shore-to-sea gunnery. It has fantastic views out to sea all the way to the horizon. The aim would be to disrupt any Allied fleet. And as we walk down into the bunker, you can't help but imagine the Germans hunkered down during that bombardment, during the bombing and during the naval gunfire. And they would have been on the receiving end of all of that.
and as we get into the control room and the lower observation deck, you can see the thick glass doors on the bunker. The recesses for the electrical signaling system are still present, and remember, the guns are essentially blind. They rely on firing data provided by the command post, and they engage based on that bearing and elevation data provided by this command post. But on D-Day, the electrical communication system were damaged by the bombing, which hampered their ability to effectively do this. Now let's look at the many concrete tobrooks located around this site. Some of them are for mortars, some of them are for machine guns, and some housed 20mm anti-aircraft guns. This is one of the mortar to Brooks which protected this position. On that pintle would have been mounted a uh, French mortar and the mortar would have been able to fire down onto the beach in case the Allies were conducting a beach assault like they did at Point de Hoc, but they never did in this location. So this, uh, this mortar to Brooks never actually fired, but you can see the recesses for the ammunition inside there and the pintle where the mortar would have been mounted. It would have had a range of approximately four kilometers. So it would have defended this position it was never actually used when the Devons came to clear this position. And that's the, the pintle mount where the mortar would have been fixed. It's a really bad audio in here. It's really echoey. Hopefully you get a feel for what it looked like. Okay, we're now going to see a Tobruk that housed a 20mm anti-aircraft gun. And there were actually three of these on this location. So if you're trying to think what a 20mm cannon looks like, think back to the movie Saving Private Ryan, where the Germans used a 20mm cannon in the direct fire roll, and it's absolutely deadly. So it wasn't until D-Day plus one when the British Devonshire Regiment finally took this position, but not after the guns had fired 115 rounds onto the Allied troops. Should this position have been raided like at Merville and at Point to Hop? Let me know what you think in the comments below. I really hope you enjoyed this video, a quick look at one of the most impressive coastal fortress positions. If you did enjoy it, please leave a comment and like the video, it all helps this channel to grow. And now, a look ahead to my next video, where we get on the beach and we get our feet wet, following the Canadian assault at Juno. Until next time. Now a couple of people have asked about the Brenslinger top I'm wearing in some of these videos and they've asked where they can get their hands on it. Reaper17 is the store that I use so visit their website which you can find in the description to get your hands on this top and others just like it. I don't really promote brands on this channel but I make an exception for this brand. They are veteran owned and veteran operated. All the links you need are in the description below.